So we can start with, let's say, each presentation will be roughly 45 minutes, give questions, we have time for a couple of questions that directly address the text. So 45, 45, and then Ray, and then we keep it open, you know, for another, you know, maybe we can do a break somewhere. There will be some wine uh, coming up soon. And, uh, well, so... We yeah, but we were adding a bit like maybe like no, because it's not serious, but we should be quiet. So 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 we should be quiet. Bueno, pues eh, eh, la introducción. Eh, bueno, no, eh, very, I, I guess um, we bio that I got from them is very minimal, so maybe I'll just keep it that way and we get into the... I, th I think in the morning we did a bit of a framing of where the text kind of comes from. Um, as I said, uh, Ray, uh, Anthony asked Ray to kind of put into publishable format uh, Ray's text into it, and then um, Anthony once again asked uh, Anna Lori to do a reply. Um, at the same time, we were organizing this, and it seemed extremely appropriate to do this presentation here. So, without any further, I want to introduce you to Anna Lori from SIC, uh, as you know, kind of representing. Is that the right word? Or not, not representing. Not, <laughs> not representing. Sick journal. Sick journal. Or uh, I think you'll kind of get an idea. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, first I want to ask if people who are here or people in the reading group read uh, Ray's text. Yeah, mm -hmm. in the reading group we read it. Okay. But yeah. Okay, so it's not unfamiliar. Um, so this um, text um, I wrote um, as a response to this essay, Wandering of Construction. And yeah, it, it's posed as one of the varied perspectives within the communization problematic as sort of discussed within SIG as a, as a group and uh, as a journal. And um, it didn't intend to respond on behalf of any notes, which this text was criticizing, but um, it kind of tried to look at the problems that um, I thought were in that text. Um, so I began with a quote um, that comes from Marx. Um, Communism is not for us a state of affairs which is to be established, an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself. And the next mm -hmm. bit is uh, the real movement that I thought it did. Communism is the real movement that I thought it for the sake of things. Um, basically, um, this is a very classic quote of Marx, and what I want to problematize, um, to problematize is that this quote, which appears to um, say that it seems to say that communism is not a static state of affairs, not a fully formed kind of an idea either. Uh, but at the same time, is it, it is it is part of the German ideology in a section entitled "The Development of the Productive Forces as a Material Premise of Communism." And um, already, I think um, there appears to be a tension produced between um, two notions of communism. Uh, communism is not a state of affairs to be established, and communism as um, the development of the productive forces in a rationally planned, equitable communist economy and society 
that overcomes a senile capitalism that suffers from internal contradictions. And this kind of notion of senility comes from Marx himself, uh, where he says, um, when he talks about um, um, the contradictions of the, cap the capitalist mode of production, the falling rate of profit, um, etc. Um, here, the capitalist mode of production is beset with another contradiction. Its historical mission is unconstrained development and geometrical progression of the productivity of human labor. It goes back on its mission whenever, as here, it checks the development of productivity. It thus demonstrates again that it is becoming senile and that it is more and more outlived. Um, so, um, within Marxism, uh, the kind of more kind of, I suppose, old-fashioned um, answer to this problem. I think was based on a philosophy of history that has been very heavily criticized but continually reappears in communist theory in various different forms. Um, communi um, communism is not an ideal but it objectively develops from the premises of a capitalist present. The promise that capitalism holds within itself, which contradicts its reality, producing a dynamic towards its own overcoming. And so um, the debate that has been raised with the acceleration manifesto um, around the modernist ideal of a rational high-tech communist future and which um, also appears in Ray Brassier's text in his discussion of endnotes follows up on an old tension that already exists within Marx's own text um, and within the history of Marx's thought. Um, what I think is at stake here is how specific notions of the human are projected into specified visions of the future, as well as how history is conceived. Um, Ray Barassi's text is concerned with this theme, but it begin, begins with the question of knowledge and clarification of terms. Um, it is the question of the articulation of cognitive abstraction with social abstraction. And quote, what exactly dis what object exactly distinguishes good, i.e., cognitively virtuous and politically emancipatory abstraction from bad, i.e., cognitively deficient and politically reactionary reactionary abstraction? How do the abstract categories of the Marxist dialectic, capital, labor value from commodity circulation production? succeed or fail to map contemporary social reality when deployed in competing and other politically and antagonistic explanations. Sorry. Um, web theory is fit to recognize the real movement abolishing the present state of things in conditions of real subsumption. Um, end of the call. So, Indeed, the relationship between cognitive abstraction, if we understand it as knowledge, and social abstraction or real abstraction, um, indeed concerns the ability to critique both capitalism and our own practice and struggles in everyday life. And um, I understand Brass's question is asking how knowledge um, or ethical judgment can be possible under so called real subsumption. Um, but um, I think, I think uh, that Ray uh, moves forward to an answer far too quickly um, in, in his text. Um, he, he, he seems to want to affirm that this is possible um, and problematize any kind of notions that might um, uh, suggest that it is not. Um, so, I suppose, to just affirm the question of agency, uh, but the question is the how. Um, further, such knowledge and judgment is not only possible in order to distinguish the good theoretical abstraction, but also to distinguish good social abstractions or between progressive and regressive social forms. As the question, the question of distinguishes these two types of abstraction, 
is, is, is uh, extended to um, an ethical classification of what exists and not really the knowledge of it into good and bad, um, i.e. So it, the category is the, the understanding of theory is sort of, there's a parallel between the understanding of, of good and bad theory with understanding of good and bad parts of present social existence. Um, so um, the problem with this assumption is not that it is an eth it, that it is posed as an ethical problem, but that it implies um, a theoretical decision that predates the revolutionary moment, and in doing so, it preempts the multiplicity of, des of desires and conflicts that are unleashed in uh, unleashed in struggles. Um, I think it, that reduces into rational decision making to be carried out ahead of time, um, usually by intellectuals like us of a particular background of social and social experience. Um, so, in reducing that multiplicity, it also preempt. It's also an act of power, um, and um, as becomes clear later in. Um, the text, this rational identification of the good reduces critical thought to having to locate a hidden emancipatory core in the present, which must be, or should be, or the question is us, that, you know, I think the text is trying to encourage us to think that it should be advocated or rescued. Um, um, I would like to say more about this and explain it more because there were discussions earlier about this, but maybe um, we can do that later. Um, so this project of locating emancipatory elements in the present is not merely an attempt to find something from which to begin, but I think it's founded on the progressivism of Marxist thought uh, for um, that has been an element of Marxist thought for, for, for over, over a century. Uh, the questions of what is progressive about, about capitalism, what we want to keep, are attached without making it explicit to a conservative version of the Hegelian concept of Aufhebung, the idea that the overcoming of capitalism is not a total transformation, uh, it's not a negation of everything that exists so that something new might emerge, but rather that this overcoming must necessarily leave intact the progressive elements of capitalism, the so-called progressive elements of capitalism, because it is those elements that point towards this overcoming. Um, whether it is a contradiction between the forces and the relations of production, between labor and capital, between the ideal and the real, or between rationality and its perversion, this produces a dialectical dynamic that produces an overcoming, um, as self heaven as the reunification of that which is separated, as the overcoming of contradiction and alienation. Um, this conception of overcoming assumes that these positive elements existing within capitalism represent a progressive force, and it, often explic explicitly associated with particular notions of the human, which merely has to divest itself from the perverted fetters of value in order to be reunited with or become true to itself. Um, okay, I mean, this is an undercurrent that I find exists, but I think the, the biggest problem with that, to, to interpret what I've written a bit more, um, is to, is the finding, is the moment of finding the, the, the element that is to be kept, or the element that will, that will be the one that will produce the overcoming, um, that I find problematic. Um, so if we argue that such a, such a positive element of capitalism is no one to be found, um, we do away with the certainty of an overcoming, but not this possibility, in my view. Um, we open a way for the criticism of all those elements of capitalism here to see as objects of liberation through to their very core. So labor, the forces of production, and capitalism accelerating force and even that rationality are no longer to be seen as something good that has become perverted, but are to be critiqued as such. Um, so in, in, 
coming to the present historical moment, um, revolutionary theories and theoretical projects or the revolutionary projects can only with great difficulty, difficulty avoid being uh, gestural and they tend to be disconnected from the actual struggles that take place uh, which also face huge kind of obstacles. Um, should I wait? Um, they're facing a state that no longer integrates demands, except if they concern policing immigration and sending women back to their proper places. Demands appealing to bourgeois ideals, such as we are citizens, we are hardworking, we are also human, are up against a state whose main concern is to police and silence, if not kill proletarians who are treated as an, uh, an essential appendage to capitalist reproduction. So while these struggles can end with the empowerment of the most reactionary types of demands, they can sometimes also be more destructive than they are so socially constructed, repudiating these bourgeois ideals as they exist today um, as the weapons of a power that represents and manages society, the state. This criticism is negative in the full sense of the word, reaching levels of suicidality. Um, because the positivity of that communist society today and unknown, the narrative that led to it in a straight line is debunked and all we have is a criticism of the present through the practices of struggles of the present which are practices of the fragmented proletariat with no ambition to unify or take power and manage anything at all. So, this criticism in struggles produces conflicts within struggles that seem insurmountable. And here I have in mind, on one hand, um, the uprising in Western East Ukraine, um, of which is an example of the most kind of reactionary version of, of, of these struggles. Um, so riot and even war against the state does not entail a critique of the state, but the, re the rebels themselves become the state, imposing wage and pension cuts and, cuts and shooting down protesters, as in Donbass. Um, and um, another example, is Ferguson, um, for example, the intergenerational conflict that has emerged in Ferguson um, doesn't seem like a, something that could move forward by, by uniting the two generations, but it's actually the younger generation that seems to have, to have a better kind of grasp of the situation that they're facing. Um, So the, the very premises of the question of categorizing good and bad abstractions, um, I think, are mistaken. Um, the question of the transformation of objective and subjective relations and forms of being, the becoming other than or beyond capitalists, is an open question of the process, process of radical criticism of the present and of the possibility of overcoming the limits of who we are. Um, it is a question of transformation through struggles and internal conflicts within them. It is not one of decision and classification of um, good and bad abstractions. Um, the question is also posed in another way in Brassner's text, um, uh, which calls us to reconsider the exact sense in which we are constituted by the capital relation, as well as the link between cognitive and practical conditions for its abolition. The cognitive conditions for the abolition of the capital relation could, in, could be interpreted as an understanding of um, a how-to of abolition before it takes place. Alternatively, the question might concern the relative autonomy of the cognitive faculties that they are capable of envisioning a way out of capitalism. It appears that the latter is the case, although I leave it open that I might have misinterpreted uh, uh, what Brasser is saying. 
Um, but um, I made this interpretation because Brassian later goes on to criticize Kamat's notion of the subsumption of life and subjectivity under capital, which leads the latter to propose an exit into a genuine human community as the only way of dealing with um, a totalizing capital. And while I think there are very valid grounds for this criticism of Kamat, um, I don't think this, this validity extends to uh, rehabilitating the target of Kamat's criticism. Um, I think that Kamat's um, criticism of the growth of productive forces is the condition sine qua non of liberation of communism as a new mode of production um, of the free or the free association of producers. The notion that both struggles and the class relation itself are mystified under capitalism. I don't. I think that this criticism can be made without using Kamat's um, notion of subsumption. Um, I think the useful concepts here are uh, fetish and real obstruction. Um, the fetishism. I think, but um, what what I'm trying to say is that fetishism is ubiquitous in, in, in capitalism. Um, it obscures mediation. I mean, this is really compact because if I was going to talk about fetishism in detail, that would be the whole TED. <laughs> um, but basically, what I wanted to emphasize here is that I agree with Brasier's emphasis on social practice. But I think it is precisely social practice that produces um, this fetishism. I mean, I think this, this is quite clear in Marx's own writing um, that um, it is the practices of a change of, of what we do as part of this capitalist world that produce the ideas that we have about this world, the concepts that um, are used to describe it. Um, so, um, it is social practice that produces adequate conceptual forms or real abstractions for the social forms of historically emerging practices of social reproduction. Um, and the other thing that was in this paragraph, um, it is social practice that produces the real abstraction of abstract labour. Who, upon whose management a society is founded and most likely also a state as a centralized mechanism that administers this growth of the process of production. So I think um, if the growth of the productive forces is interpreted to mean it or is that the, it's the main kind of concept that unites kind of future society. <coughs> Then um, I think I think it's very difficult to also claim that abstract labor can can be overcome in such a such a society and or the state. Um, uh, so uh, Brasser's criticism of Kamat for his appeal to a human community whose basic expressive modalities remain constant across millennia. That was Brasser's quote. Uh, this criticism is justified. Um, while the abolition of capitalism, however, cannot be an undoing or a wish that capitalism never happened, um, we agree in that it also cannot be a realization of a progressive <coughs> promise that capitalism holds within itself, that of the growth of the productive forces or any other promise. Um, both conceptions are versions of the same, in my view, the same dialectization of history, alienation on one side of heaven on the other, um, which are characteristic of both bourgeois and working class revolutionary ideologies of the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, the alienation of man from himself and nature, capitalism as the most developed from a form of society and its overcoming and preservation, as the realization of and return to the wholeness of the species, capitalism perverting and constraining the progressive productive forces and becoming more and more outlived, communism as the full development of the productive forces in a worker society of high tech, product, high -tech production for all, accelerations, um, or, or alternatively, um, in communes that return to nature conceived in its idealized purity. 
in all these conceptions, history is no longer produced and the content of communism is predetermined. So if the abolition of capitalism is possible, um, that's a quote you put on the foster, our questions um, should go beyond the defensive, this kind of defensive dialectization. And I think um, communist theory should be produced uh, based on the struggles that take place today when this notion of, of progress have, has lost social validity. Um, uh, the failure of class revolution, the decline of the workers' movement, the failure of social movements to make significant gains in the past 40 years that would add up to a dynamic that would challenge this lack of progressive notions. Um, yeah, all, all these have killed off any delusion that the history is on the side of proletarians. So, um, yeah. I feel like I'm stating the obvious, but I feel like I'm stating the obvious against positions that are also presented as obvious. So, um, <laughs> um, so uh, Ray Brasser argues in favour of the necessity of radiation on a planet of 7 billion people so that a real universality, a maximally expansive human solidarity can exist beyond parochial communitarianism. He reminds us of the concept of species being, as Marina mentioned as well, understood not as a biological category but as a capacity for collective self-transformation beyond self-reproduction the states of the divisive identifications of individuality, ethnicity, and nationality. Um, it is worth considering this interpretation of species being beyond um, that of Marx. Um, I think uh, Marx's, Marx's own definition uh, can have various interpretation that can restrict um, um, the definition of the human, which, like my argument, is to leave that open. Um, um, so, even if such a universality could then involve multiple and singular life activities, so I'm um, talking about life activity because this long footnote here um, refers to labour and the biggest problem that I find with Marx's definition um, of, of um, species being in the manuscript is that he identifies labor as a kind of as a core kind of human quality. Um, um, so if we can just speak about life activities and more abstractly, the question of how human social human activity could one day be something different than the abstract label mediated by value is extremely hard to answer. Um, one of the answers that Brasser proposes is, are the concepts of impersonality, impartiality and objectivity as positive resources for expanding the horizons of socialization. Um, to me they seem insufficient uh, because they are very close to the familiar principles of bourgeois legal judgment. Um, so laws and legal procedures are established to apply the abstract individual to the abstract individual objectively and impartially. But of course these values leave on questions the principles and social relations that these laws will produce. Um, so for the application of a law equally objectively and impartially to all is what courts do. If it is mostly proletarians that end up in jail, it's not caused by the judge's bias, but by the very content of the law. So what is socially defined as criminal, what is socially defined as criminal is an act of power um, and the result of a very partial social struggle. The notion of the true impartiality and objectivity would imply the end of all struggles and debates. But is this not, is this not precisely what courts assume is true when they apply the law? <coughs> all these debates have ended. Um, 
So, bourgeois equality, just like abstract labor, is founded on precisely this kind of impersonality of the equality of individuals devoid of content and particularity, and most importantly, devoid of materiality, bodily or economic, in a political sphere that is by definition blind to it. So, fairness is translated into meritocracy. If you can't, you don't deserve, it's nothing personal, you're just not good enough, objectively. Um, um, the emphasis on the, the indispensableness of, of impersonality, I think, only presents itself as a given necessity and as an ideal, because in capitalism, the impersonal appears as um, an advance from pre-capitalist societies. In personality, um, the impersonal is a level of law, law and right, um, while the personal is identified with pre-capitalist forms of community and personal forms of power. But the personal can also mean other things. The personal, apart from a form of social power, also designates <coughs> a social level at which the singularity of each person in the full material dimension and in their difference can be recognized. Um, recognition, I mean, that's a concept that um, I'm kind of not well developed in my mind, but I think there's a lot of promise in it. Um, as a, as a concept of singularity or difference counterpose to the separation, classification, characterization, categorization of individuals according to the capacity of labor to consume their usefulness to society and according um, to the division of labor, which is what, what kind of forms of identity um, we see produced in capitalism. Um, and what forms of kind of social categorization from the perspective of the state. Um, so, I think the latter categorizing form is more consistent with um, a notion of universality based on this abstract man that presupposes ideal norms. Um, and, um, what I find particularly interesting is the notion of recognition in Richard Dunn's work um, where he says that a common world, or in other words, a valid external world which could pre-channel recognition into authoritative configurations and which could serve as a shared touchstone to which interactive individuals might prefer, it's just what the play of mutual recognition excludes. The revolutionary demolition of such a world and of the role definitions in theory in it was required to effect the transi transition from a misery cognitive to a mutually recognitive terrain. Radical insecurity is the sole statute under which mutual recognition can come into being and through which it can sustain itself. Um, so, um, this is kind of an argument, I read this as an argument um, that opposes the finality of recognition as a finality of something that can, can reach this end in some sort of idea of communism, where like this kind of objectivity can exist. Um, so recognition is never one of abstract classification, but always under condensation of both recognized and unrecognized. It also means that the meaning of human is multiple and open-ended. How could an impersonal, objective and impartial universality not be a legal universality based on the rational classification of empty individuals? And how could such a rational classification not sacrifice or oppress the exceptional or unclassified <coughs> in particular for the benefit of society's norms, I suppose? Um, so it should be clear uh, by this point that expanding the horizons of socialization is itself not an unequivocal ideal. 
particularly when in capitalism, as much as in socialist or state capitalism states, it has meant the socialization of labor and the unification of individuals under the state. Mediation is then a problem, not an answer. How can this universality not be a bourgeois universality? And how can it not be an impersonal or oppressive social unity like that imposed in the, in the bourgeois state, by the bourgeois state? Um, so, um, the next problem uh, Ray Grassi raises is the paradox of self-abolition that Marina also discussed. Um, I will not read the quote again. I will just say that the paradox to me appears to be based on a confusion of, of terms and their reduction to logic, um, which is precisely the logicization of reality that Brasir is trying to argue against in his text. I actually had trouble understanding if, the, if this paradox was supposed ironically or sarcastically or if it was actually presented as a serious thing. But, okay, if we do take it as a serious thing, um, um, nothing outside the class relation does not mean that the self-abolition entails nothingness, but rather that proletarian identity cannot be affirmed today, not because capital is an absolute subject whose logic determines reality to the extent that struggle in history no longer exists, but rather because proletarian reproduction is now entirely dependent on capitalist reproduction and the present model of accumulation treats labour power as a mere cost. Not only is a flight no longer possible as proletarian life entirely depends on accumulation, at the same time as only any guarantees of such life are defunct, but proletarians also cannot find a positivity in themselves as part of accumulation. So self-abolition then emerges as a possibility when the self-affirmation of class identity becomes no more than the affirmation of a category of capital, variable capital, whose disposability and fragmentation erodes the class's capacity for organizing politically to affirm itself in demand struggles. Only the practical criticism of one's position as it exists and is reproduced in capitalist society then has the potential to abolish the relation of which this part. But what I, I find more confusing or absent in the, paragra the paradox is a recognition of what the we really means. Um, um, the we that is abolished is not just any collective subject um, in general. It's not a popular we, it's not a we the people. It's um, it's a material subjectification of the relations of exploitation and power in capitalist society. Proletarians and capitalists, women and men, racialized groups, these are just some examples, there's more. The universality and singularity that could emerge from this abolition is not the same as the particularity that abolished it of the subject that carried it out, which only emerges in the process of struggle. So if proletarians abolish proletarian as a valid social category, if they abolish class, they are no longer proletarians, women are no longer women, the bodily difference has no present social significance, blacks are no longer blacks. I mean, this is what self-abolition means. Uh, it's not a devolution of oneself as a human being, it's not suicide. Um, <laughs> They, so it means, it means transformation of the subject, essentially. It means that you're no longer the subject that you used to be and you're someone else. Some, something else. So, so it would be something else it would be both singular and universal. The possibility of self-definition, of the redefinition of what is human. Um, so it is, this something else the abolition, that abolition produces is a desubjectification which objectively overcomes the limit of what one is. Um, and the paradox seems to be unable to conceive of that. Um, 
But this is the conception of a potential transformation, not the application of a logical necessity that is somehow realized. Um, that. Um, <coughs> there are some far more important problems, I think, concerning self-abolition. It is not definitely not a non-problematic concept. So some, some questions to discuss are how can proletarians struggle without forming into a self-affirmative subject? What are the practices that could suggest a self-negating subject? How far can the self-negation go? This is not a question of subjectivity of consciousness, but one of practice. The burning of factories can seem to be a rejection of labor, but it is often part of demand struggles in places like India, Bangladesh, or Vietnam. Rioting and uprisings can be part of the affirmation of a national identity, as we have seen in the Ukraine. Women and men demonstrating against rape can at the same time, through their demands, be affirming the state and the family, as we saw in India. We can say that these are the internal limits of struggles and that these limits are the very dynamic, as the theory community says, but often there is hardly any dynamic towards the overcoming of such limits. So how could such a dynamic be produced? And of course, struggles do not occur in a vacuum, and apart from internal limits, there are also external limits, um, such as the state as a force, its police and army, um, as well as the necessities of survival. And finally, I think the we that should be problematized is not just the we of self-abolition, but also the we uh, that builds a society, the very notion of the universal and of what society is. Um, So, um, Ednote's argued lack of distinction between conceptual and real abstraction is said to lead them to a wholesale rejection of technology's function as such. So I wanted to discuss um, the way in which the concept of function is used in, uh, in Ray Brassian's text, uh, who brings up antivirals as an example of uh, the emancipatory potentials latent in technologies whose function is functioning is currently subordinate to capital, is his words. Um, Brassier recognizes the development of these technologies in capitalist social forms, but conceives of, of their function as something that can be separated. And the quote is, a suitable abstract conception of function will allow for its transplantation where necessary, repurposing across, and where necessary, repurposing across social contexts. Um, but current technology's emancipatory potential or function is not merely something mechanical. It is evidently grounded on its use value today, since the whole point in maintaining its function is its utility. But the emphasis on the very question of keeping its useful function is a holding on to how we live today that sets limits on its criticism. Following the example of antivirals, why should we assume today that in the future survival from illness would have to involve medicine as it exists today? And even if, it's the, if this is the case, how is it possible to extricate this function from its whole system of production? Uh, the complex, oppressively hierarchical divisions of labor and power relations between the, speci the specialist knowledge producer and its human objects, the human objects of medical science, between the researcher and the factory workers. Um, and these are power relations on which today depend the production of medical knowledge as well as the commodities based on it. So is it conceivable to extricate this function and social usefulness from the very definition of health and illness and the social hierarchies they imply? Um, the use value this argument attempts to extract as an emancipatory potential from within capitalist commodities, um, I think cannot exist as a mere mechanical functionality that can be separated from the social, the capitalist mode of relating, and even less so from its subjection to exchange value 
antivirals and other medicine and medical, medical techniques and technologies are today neither invented nor produced for the good of humanity but for profit and precisely this shapes both their social and material aspects. So it is impossible to recover use value from commodities as they exist today because use value is not the mere mechanical or biological usefulness of things but it is the other side of exchange value which drives the production of commodities. So taken as far as it can go, this criticism of use value is the condition of possibility for the production of new forms of knowledge and technology which are not guided by value nor by labor, labor as the universe, universal quality of humanity and by an entirely different logical um, social relating. Um, but um, Brasser's objection is that refusing to keep this notion of function um, abolishes the capitalist present at the cost of cancelling the post-capitalist future locked up within it. Foreclosing the future of linked obligation cannot but wish to reinstate, reinstate the past. It becomes a longing for a previous state of things. End of quote. Um, but from this perspective, I think the current anti-development anti struggles against the very material form and function of mines and factories, high-speed trains, airports, etc., often despite high local unemployment, could be dismissed as localist or attached to a past way of life. And in a sense they are. Here is the contradiction. Mines are highly polluting and they involve punitive forms of labor, so much so that for many communities, agriculture is strongly preferable. But mines also provide the raw material for most of today's advanced technology. If they if the enjoyment of the forest or the use of its water for agriculture can be conceived as desiring a previous state of things over the advances of capitalist mining. This only shows that the achievements of capitalist modernity were supposed forms of technological function, which particularly at the points of production are not universally welcome, despite their usefulness. Um, okay. I think more problematically the concept of rational repurposing presupposes an agent that manages that, that repurposing which is to say an agent that centrally manages production, having appropriated the entirety of capitalist infrastructure. Even though uh, Brasser does not appear to subscribe to this accelerationist notion of a central rational blind authority. Um, the question remains of how the production of all the technologies whose functions are still useful uh, would be managed in the future society that he imagines, if not through a central authority or a state. If social unity is to be founded on complex global scale production, and if such production is to continue functioning with today's effectiveness, this would require a complex and hierarchical division of labor, which presupposes social divisions as well as centralized power, a centralized power that would ensure that things function that everyone who is able to contribute to society by working and everyone can be fairly remunerated. So beyond the difficult problem of mediation, um, I would ask what, what, what would be the measure of fairness here. There's also the question of how this could take place without the specialization of management and by extension social management. I mean, Yeah, I think, I think this kind of criticism of primitivism um, ends up as, as nostalgic um, resorts to a different kind of humanism um, that is based on the, on the notion of human progress through history and um, that I think and not the human as a primarily rational being.
um, without questioning the very concept of rationality, because perhaps rationality could mean something different than what it means today. Um, so I think that um, that conception can lead to conservative conser conservatism. Um, that would reproduce the same material social divisions and ways of life um, that um, it would be attempting to overcome. So we'll have a couple of questions now and then go to the notes. So, uh, uh, there is already one question. But maybe it should come from someone else since I'm about to do this. If talk. somebody else has a question that has been talked uh, and wants to address it, mm -hmm. uh, otherwise we. Yeah. Doesn't seem so. <laughs> okay. So there's a couple of key thoughts that I've got on this. Um, it's very, it's great text. Um, one. The first one I'll start with is it seems to me that underlying the perspective here, it's not really named as such, but there's, there's something that you could call maybe mode of production constructionism, um, as in the claim that all of everything that we can think, uh, anything that, any judgments that we can have now are fundamentally constructed in relation to the mode of production and thus we don't know about their possible applicability beyond this mode of production. No, that's not what I'm saying. Um, it's that, that those judgments that you or I or him can have now are positioned from our position. Yeah, it is, it is not because of the mode of production mm -hmm. that subjectifies everyone in the same way, mm. but that from my position I can say, well, this seems wrong and this seems right and I want this to continue this thing and I want that. And like this other person who lives like in say a mountain in Mexico might say, no, I don't want this mm -hmm. and I want things to be different. And this is a possibility of conflict. I mean the desires that, that could emerge in a revolutionary moment, that's what I want to leave open, that, that the possibility that would be that there would be conflict and whatever we say about this now could be proven entirely wrong. Um, that that's what I I want to say. So like the so if if I say okay, an ideal world would consist of things being arranged in this way and that way, and then in the process of doing so, in, or in the process of in the practice of trying to do so, you discover that that's not the case at all. Um, that somebody ends up being oppressed in that situation. Um, and, and, the, and also it is, it is also the, 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 the openness of the process of mutual recognition is an open process that doesn't have a final stage where things are like configured in the perfect way that everybody agrees on and it's objectively, objectively true, right, uh, ethically good and like Everyone is happy. That that I mean that's kind of what. Uh, does anybody else have a question? Other words? Oh, I have. Uh, I have a oh, okay, perfect. Um, we haven't really talked about this yet in the sort of discussion about self-abolition, but I was interested in thinking about the history of that concept, starting out from Marx. And I guess, obviously, I mean, yeah, I just wanted to hear your thoughts about the history of that concept, because obviously in Marx, self-abolition involves a communist party or a faction, the proletarian, the faction of the proletarian. So I guess I was interested in thinking about the form self-abolition is projected to take by communist theory also accord with the way, the sort of, uh, the kinds of, um, yeah, the way the proletarians were produced in the capital relation at that time, which includes political forms. So say, for example, uh, capital is sort of in the 19th century, um, 
is industrializing, is developing, is kind of building up its forces, so must the counter to capital do that. Um, and in an era when capital is striving to like physically and politically abolish the proletariat themselves, like now, rather than kind of build them up, even um, as against kind of a, um, proletarian politics, obviously have a different vision of what building up the proletariat means from capital in the 19th century, but now I guess it's like the movement is more from both sides towards abolition or decomposition, if you will. So I guess I'm kind of interested in how the history of self-abolition is affected by historical circumstances as a prescription for um, proletarian politics of communism. I mean, I, I would agree with the first part but I um, I don't particularly agree with formulations that talk about capital as abolishing the proletariat on its own. Um, it it excludes um, I mean the way that capitalism is reproduced in the spirit of crisis as well it excludes or produces superfluous populations in relation to their uh, potential for uh, participating in a labor contract, um, but they are still proletarians, and I am not entirely sure that this tendency uh, uh, might continue forever. It could be that capitalism finds a solution to its crisis and problems and manages to reincorporate. Um, a great part of this population. Um, I wouldn't say, and also because my um, economics, perhaps my economics is not as good, is not that good but um, I would kind of leave that possibility open mm -hmm. as well. Yes, and um, the question just becomes does their capital relation dictate the form of self evolution in any historical period? Or is there a certain structural consistency to that concept? Um, yeah, it does. I mean, it, it definitely affects the way that we think about it. Um, but we can't say for sure that it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. I think the way we think about it is also shaped by yeah. how our relationship to capital and how capital is destroying certain forms of identification or organization. That our, the way we think about destroying ourselves is obviously shaped by that. Yeah. Let's see how that's just going on. Oh, I mean, she agree with that. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just going to let it come in to introduce a bit um, uh, Rob and Zoe from EndNotes, um, which they have been, I guess, crucial in, on the one hand, um, bringing um, the whole debate that was happening, I guess, in France, uh, around the ultra left and around the whole communication, bring it uh, into an English context and with M notes, which I guess started 2010, eight, eight, uh, nine. The group started 2005, but oh, the, we, the okay. first one was published in 2008. Okay, 2008. Uh, there's other questions that I would like to ask about the, your the relationship between Up Heaven and and not that anyway, that's a, another question. But <laughs> saying that this, uh, they've been great in able to present, um, historize, and deal with this theory in the English context. And thanks to Federico, we've been able to learn from it, you know, in, in Spanish. But they've been, uh, you know, the first two issues, maybe they were more historical, presenting certain amounts of debates. Uh, also, they have written this text that has been crucial for the workshop, which is the history of subsumption. And that was like a crucial text that we read. 
uh, and then uh, now we are seeing maybe in the number three, issue number three, that they are starting to maybe uh, more and more bring your own, you know, that kind of proposals and theoretical kind of uh, conceptual understandings. Uh, and in fact, this text might be uh, the one that they are presenting today might be coming in, in, in note five, four. Uh, in fact, it's the, the one that we're talk, discussing tomorrow is the Hendrix board. This is more some, just a talk. So. Ah, okay. So you, you get that. But here there is uh, the number one, two and three and I strongly recommend them. Um, so without... So if anybody wants us to get quickly some wine and water, uh, please feel free.